episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. All right, welcome, uh, everybody, once again to another episode of our show uh, with another guest that is uh, doing, as we say, uh, creating a, a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, so, uh, you know, here in, uh, we're at near the end of 2020. Uh, we've gone through a major viral pandemic this year, uh, but we can't forget that uh, almost a century now after the first antibiotics were discovered, the drug-resistant bacterial infections uh, have become a major threat around the globe. Uh, unfortunately, at the same time that the antibiotic pipelines of, of pharma have either dried up or uh, they've gotten out of the business entirely, uh, United States Center for Disease Control estimates that we have more than 2 million uh, drug-resistant uh, infections in the United States alone, over 35,000 deaths per year because of them. Uh, and there was a United Nations report recently that concluded by 2050, if we don't do something about this, uh, superbugs could ultimately kill 10 million people every year uh, if no action is taken to combat this problem. Uh, a, a solution to this emerging threat uh, lies in the area of bacteriophage therapy, or phage for short, which uh, uh, refers to a type of virus that likes to infect, replicate, and are very good at killing uh, bacteria. Uh, interestingly, phage therapy has been used for uh, close to 100 years now as an alternative antibiotics in different countries uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, and now seen as potential remedies not just against multidrug resistant strains of bacteria, but also uh, to interfere with various aspects of bacterial life cycles, uh, biofilm production, quorum sensing, and so forth. Uh, we're honored today to be joined by Dr. Robert Schooley, uh, who is a University of California, San Diego, professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health. Uh, he's co-director of the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, uh, as well as a faculty director of global education and senior director of international initiatives. Uh, Dr. School is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, he completed his internal medicine residency uh, at Hopkins and in infectious disease fellowships in National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, he joined uh, the Harvard Medical School back in 1981. Uh, he was uh, elected the chair of the National Institutes of Health AIDS Clinical Trial Group in 1995, uh, which led into 2002, uh, where they performed a lot of the seminal studies in, in modern antiviral uh, chemotherapy and ultimately joined the faculty at uh, UC San Diego, where he currently serves as the uh, head of the Division of Infectious Diseases. Uh, he's also the editor-in-chief of Clinical Infectious Disease uh, Journal, and his research interests are rather broad in terms of the diagnosis, pathogenesis, and therapy of uh, viral infections in global health. Uh, Dr. Schooley, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come on the show today. Glad to be here. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, you know, typically start off by just handing the guests the floor for a little bit, just to uh, talk a little bit more about themselves. If you could sort of uh, take us on, a, on a, a little journey about sort of your background, you know, where you grew up, how you got interested in medicine and infectious diseases, and, and a little bit of your journey towards this, uh, well, I'll call it ra rather bleeding edge of therapeutics. Uh, I, it's a great way to start out. Well, I, was, I grew up in Alabama and uh, uh, knew from a pretty early age that I wanted to go into medicine. I found a um, autobiography when I was a fifth grader, uh, not too long ago, in an old uh, box of things my, uh, that had been in my parents' house. And it was either me or someone who signed his name to my paper that uh, said that uh, I want to be a pediatrician when I grew up. And uh, when I got to medical school years later at Hopkins, I um, looked at a lot of different areas of medicine, but what really uh, occurred to me, what, what really appealed to me about uh, infectious diseases is that um, the uh, things we had to treat people with were, for the kinds of diseases we saw then, bacterial infections, so good compared to other areas of medicine that uh, we would give somebody with heart failure some digitalis and they do all right for six or eight months and they're back to where they started. But when you had someone who had an infection uh, and you gave them the right antibiotic, uh, you could make a big difference and they could be back on their feet and back at work or back at school uh, a week and a half later. And uh, so it was really the ability to go in and do something dramatic that had a big impact on someone's life who might otherwise have died that was really very appealing. The other part of it that was appealing to me is that the people uh, who get infectious diseases are disproportionately uh, people who are uh, often disconnected from the healthcare system and from society in general. And so there were people who uh, often uh, don't have access to the kinds of healthcare that uh, all the rest of us uh, 
have and would aspire to. And so I uh, have always wanted to help um, and be engaged with uh, populations that uh, haven't been as fortunate as, um, as I've been uh, growing up um, and uh, in terms of having access to healthcare. I appreciate that background. Thank you. Um, you know, about a year ago, uh, I got to spend some time with, with Stephanie Strathy, uh, who uh, is involved with your initiative at, uh, at, at the IPATH. And um, at the time, uh, you know, we had discussed a little bit about sort of how this area was developing. And I think recently, uh, the two of you, uh, I, I was a, a journal, a clinical microbiology, you wrote a, uh, an interesting paper entitled Treat Phage uh, like living antibiotics, which I, you know, basically sort of a lays the groundwork for sort of how to move sort of what we sort of see as sort of an unconventional therapy when we think of a living antibiotic, uh, not what we normally think of in terms of sort of the traditional pharmacotherapeutic uh, armamentarium, whether it's a small molecule or a protein. Here we're dealing something with a little different, uh, but at the same time, here we are in the 21st century now, and a lot of the drugs that we have uh, coming down the pipelines are unique, whether we're talking about gene therapies or cell therapies or uh, any of a, a list of other uh, cutting edge stuff. Could you take us on a little bit of the uh, sort of the, the path in terms of obviously um, regulators nowadays in the US uh, have seen things that look a little different than traditional drugs, that's a positive. At the same time, you know, you still have um, a lot of the things we talked about last year where you have to, phages have to be very you know, specifically isolated for specific strains of bacteria. Obviously, there's, it's a cocktail, it's a, it's a messy drug, let's say, versus a traditional one. How have things developed in terms of, of looking at phage as sort of that, a therapeutic entity as opposed to sort of this other, other thing as it was looked at in the past? I think the uh, the misfortune that Bosch had was they came along uh, before antibiotics and before we understood uh, microbiology as we do now. Had they not been discovered in the uh, second decade of the last century uh, and uh, been um, kind of tossed about without actually knowing the specific organism being treated or how to monitor the uh, course of the infection uh, and uh, essentially being used in thousands and thousands of anecdotes, um, I think we'd be in a much more scientific framework uh, in terms of phage development. And what I think has happened the last couple of years is that those of us who have been working in this field are saying, uh, we should stop talking about phage or antibiotics, but phage are really, they're antibiotics. They do the same thing that um, small molecules do. The only difference is there are many more of them in the plant than there are uh, the antibiotics we have on the shelf and they're uh, evolving all the time. Uh, phages are always looking uh, for another bacterium to eat. And whenever a bacterium comes along that's new, uh, there's gonna be a, a, to, to use a trite phrase as a phage for that. And so uh, what we really um, are trying to do is harvest um, natural evolution uh, to be able to stay ahead of bacterial evolution, uh, because we've not been able to do that with our small molecule, small molecular chemistry. Uh, we've got uh, trillions and trillions of entrepreneurs out there trying to outsmart the bacterium uh, around it. And there are only so many chemists in the world. So I, uh, I think that uh, we're really just uh, taking advantage of a natural phenomenon and trying to bring it uh, to the bedside and help patients. When we do that, we have to use the same approach we do with small molecules, and that is, you have to think about um, giving the right one. Uh, you can't just choose any antibiotic when someone comes up with an infection, you have to choose the right one. Uh, you have to think about how to give the antibiotic. Do you give it orally? Do you give it intravenously? Where do you want it to go? What is, does it need to go to the gallbladder or to the lungs? That depends on where the infection is. And then you have to figure out uh, how much you have to give to have it there continuously enough to be able to, uh, to um, keep the bacterial infection at bay while your immune system comes in. And uh, we just, uh, all we're really trying to do with uh, the science of phage therapy now is learning how to do the same thing uh, with phages. And in some ways it's easier because um, with antibiotics, some of them don't get into the prostate and other ones um, don't get into the lungs. And you always have to think about where a given antibiotic goes. Phages will go wherever the food is. And so you, if you have an infected gallbladder, they'll go there and they'll grow there. And they don't just grow there and start decaying and going away like an antibiotic does, waiting for the next dose. 
if they're bacteria there, they're growing and expanding and looking for the next bacterium to eat. So they're actually, uh, from the standpoint of, of this phrase, living antibiotics, they're uh, trying to help you out as a therapeuticist because you just have to point the way to them uh, and they're off and running. And what we have to learn how to do is to do that in a scientific way. Um, we have to learn just like we do with antibiotics about um, emergence of resistance. We see people develop resistance in the hospital to uh, antibiotics. That's why we have the need for phages. The same thing happens with them. And uh, what we do with antibiotics is we continue to follow the patient. If it looks like a new population of organisms is growing out, you bring a new antibiotic on board. And so the principles are really the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just need to think about it uh, using that scientific framework. And it becomes a lot easier for people who've been working with antibiotics to understand what they really are. You know, you, uh, you sort of very elegantly uh, mentioned in the paper, the, the phage bacteria sort of have been doing this battle or this dance for hundreds of millions of years, so obviously a lot of evolutionary time and they've gotten very good at, at, at what they do. Um, when it comes to IPATH and the Innovation Phage Applications at Therapeutic Center, um, talk a little bit about sort of what the different um, stages are, because this is sort of the first truly integrated uh, organization that is you know, doing everything from, hey, let's, we have a, a sample here that obviously has phages in it, uh, whether it comes from the ocean or a lake or, or whatever. Um, Walk through, if you would, a little bit of what happens at IPATH today, uh, sort of the different sort of buckets or different specialties uh, that um, have to occur, you know, obviously similar to uh, CMC or the pharmacokinetics, or what have you, and traditional drug development. What are the different things that you work on there in terms of sort of how you produce a specific therapy uh, to ultimately study uh, in the clinic? Well, when a patient comes to our attention, and it often happens when a patient's family or a patient writes us or a patient's physician who knows about the science of it gets in touch with us. We have a, a, a um, website that um, uh, people will contact and they'll say, I've got a 48-year-old uh, aunt who has been in the hospital with uh, X and they've had this infection that they haven't been able to cure and it's uh, clear and it's resistant to antibiotics. Can you help us? And uh, so... Uh, we then uh, ask them to ask their physician to send us their medical records so we can look and see uh, what the organism is, uh, whether or not uh, there might be another way to treat it, uh, our antibiotics, uh, is there another antibiotic alternative? And if it looks like the patient is a good candidate for phage therapy, we then say, okay, we need to get that organism and find a phage for it. Now, sometimes um, the... Um, uh, we will have a phage here. David Pride has a great lab, has a phage library he's building, but other times we have to send it to a collaborator uh, and say, uh, do you have a phage that could be used for this particular patient? Uh, different laboratories have specialties with different kinds of, uh, of bacteria. So for example, there's a uh, lab at, um, in, uh, in Houston that really specializes in E. coli and Klebsiella. And there is a lab in uh, New Haven that specializes in Pseudomonas. And these are colleagues and friends of ours. And uh, depending on what the patient has, we'll try to get the organism to the right lab. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those labs have the ability to, uh, when they find a phage from their library, or if they have to go out and, uh, and screen for one in the environment, can um, take that phage and purify it and make it ready to go and give to the patient. Others, uh, we have to then find someone who will uh, grow it up and then purify it. Uh, to a point that it's uh, we call clinical grade, which basically means highly pure and there aren't a lot of contaminants in it. Uh, and um, when that's done, uh, we then um, have to uh, talk to the F Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, about um, this particular patient because we operate within the FDA's framework of um, drug um, development in the U.S., and what they want you to do is say, I've got, we have this patient, a 48 year old patient with so-and-so, just the one we described a minute ago. And this is why antibiotics aren't working. And so we would like to use these phages that have been shown to have this, this activity in the laboratory. And they uh, have uh, virtually always said, sure, go right ahead. Uh, and then we um, uh, either treat the patient here or if the patient's somewhere else, uh, we tell the physicians there how to do it. 
and uh, off they go. So it's really a pretty linear process that uh, we've been through um, numerous, numerous times uh, since we set the Institute up. Are, are there any interesting, um, when it comes to uh, the specificity or what type of phage is like to eat uh, certain types of bacteria, obviously, if uh, you think of somebody gets a strange infection swimming in some dirty water uh, in a river somewhere, there's obviously probably going to be some phages in there that are have been hanging out with that bacteria and are pretty good at, uh, at killing it. Uh, any interesting things that uh, sort of you don't might you might not think about, like a uh, a microbe that someone catches in the desert that uh, but the phage comes from some other ecosystem, or are they usually pretty close together? Sort of, uh, and once again, doing that sort of dance that <laughs> that evolutionary dance, um, uh, depending on sort of geography and temperature and things like that. Well, ultimately, you um, you. Uh, find phages that um, grow in the organism you're trying to treat, mm -hmm. but it's just um, one that happens to be um, uh, living in the environment rather than your patient. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so some bacteria, uh, a lot of times, um, it's like Willie Sutton, you go to where the money is. <laughs> and uh, when you're looking for robbing a bank in the place where there's a lot of money in terms of bacteria, it's sewage treatment plants. Right. And so you, you go to places like that and you... Um, uh, it's very likely that in any given sewage treatment plant, there are going to be bacteria like the patient that you're, um, you're trying to treat has, and you start going through filtrates looking for phages there. Mm -hmm. And so it really is a Sutton's Law kind of a thing. You know, one, um, as, we, as we talk about infectious diseases, and, and, and specifically in these cases, uh, bacterial infections, uh, obviously, one major clinical challenge over the last few decades um, alongside these infections, which gram negative, of course, are, is sepsis, where uh, clinical trial <laughs> results have been pretty tough for the biotechs and pharma companies with sepsis winning a lot of them. Um, there were a few papers out there that I saw that, you know, aside from uh, their sort of well-known ability to, to kill bacteria, uh, phages may also have some very interesting immunomodulating properties. And I think we, fortunately, we see a lot of this with, with COVID, the way of, a virus can do weird things uh, in terms of your immune system and all the cytokines and the different things that are going on uh, in, in, uh, in your natural immune response. Have you seen any interesting um, results, uh, things in the literature or in your own work about uh, potentially not just uh, the ability to to fight these microbes, but also deal with the, the, the side effects of sepsis, uh, or the, the very deadly effects of sepsis. Well, a couple of things that uh, phages do to the immune system. Phages um, are, um, most of them are DNA. Um, there are some exceptions, but the ones we've been using are DNA phages. And um, when they uh, break down a bacterium, uh, they um, have, like dropping a cherry bomb inside one, there are bits and pieces left over of the bacteria, mm -hmm. and there are often bits and pieces of phage DNA attached to it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that our um, innate immune system does is looks for double-stranded DNA. And uh, when it sees that, uh, it pays attention to what it's attached to. Um, the um, double-stranded DNA and other, some other uh, kind of common structures that are in places they shouldn't be are, um, are uh, termed um, PAMPs or uh, basically common features of pathogens that our innate immune system recognizes. And that kind of serves as a primer of the adaptive immune response. In other words, it presents to the uh, part of the immune response making T cells and antibodies more effectively than just the protein alone. It says, you really need to pay attention to this. Mm. and uh, it amplifies the immune response. So it's really, um, in some ways, it's like a combination of an organism that, or an agent that's trying to kill what you're trying to kill, but also one that's staying the immune system. If you haven't been watching this, you should be watching this. Uh, here's a little DNA tag to let you know this shouldn't be here. And so we think that also plays a role in some patients. It won't play a role as much, for example, in a patient who's got leukemia and is waiting for the bone marrow to come back, but it might be very important to other people whose immune system really hasn't uh, kicked in yet. Um, the, um, uh, and you know, we're, uh, 
we're learning how to uh, begin to try to exploit some of those characteristics of Hajj's, uh, and we'll be looking more carefully at it as we as we move forward. Um, next steps in terms of iPath. Uh, I, I know once again when I when I talked to Stephanie last year, things were just getting going. Um, any big plans, uh, announcements, things that uh, are coming up in 2021 that uh, you can talk about now, or well, we're working, confidential, of course. No, no, we're working with NIH to uh, try to uh, uh, help them get some clinical trials started, and uh, that's coming along very well. The NIH is getting interested now. Good. Uh, we've been working with uh, some companies that uh, have uh, new technologies that involve synthetic phages, and we want to be able to help them get them into people. So we want to be a place where um, kind of uh, first in man studies can be done in ways that we can really understand what we're doing with them and administer these new uh, approaches in safe ways to people who need them. So we're trying to develop a, a translational research uh, capacity that uh, will have us be a go-to place when people are trying to bring these new technologies to the clinic. Uh, Dr. Pride is working uh, on developing uh, phage libraries for a number of uh, different uh, bacterial um, strains. Uh, and uh, Dr. Aslam is developing a, a very uh, effective uh, a group of people who work with her to treat people with specific types of infections. Uh, and uh, so we're gradually building up a, a, um, a, strain, a stream of people working together that range from the bedside uh, to the bench and trying to integrate it in a, uh, in a way that uh, we can very quickly uh, bring something to a patient who needs it because we have all the components in one place. Um, mm -hmm. We're also collaborating with people around the country and trying to help move the field of phage therapy forward. Um, I think that there's a lot of traction with that now. I was asked by a colleague here at UC San Diego who writes a classical textbook uh, about antibiotics uh, if uh, I would write a, a um, chapter about phage for him, for his antibiotic textbook. Um, it wouldn't have been too many years ago that someone said, how about a phage therapy chapter in your textbook? He just said, you got to be kidding. Uh, this is a serious book. <laughs> so uh, things are beginning to uh, move in the direction of, um, uh, uh, let's just say Rodney Dangerfield would be pleased, getting a little more respect. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, one last thing while I have you, I, I just have to ask, uh, I have to bring up a COVID question. Um, you, you wrote this, another interesting paper a, a couple months ago. It was called uh, The Treatment of COVID-19, uh, Evidence-Based or Personalized Medicine. Uh, and, you, you know, there's obviously some comparisons here with the phage domain in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of N of 1 stuff going on, but at the same time, you got to have the, your traditional gold standard type studies, but, you know, if someone's dying, it, yeah, you have to balance things out. Uh, I would just love, based on your expertise and your time in this field, uh, your top line thoughts on uh, on where we're going with COVID. Obviously, the vaccines are are getting approved, um, but as far as sort of the uh, the therapies, uh, some of the uh, different modalities that are out there now that you know we weren't very good at several months ago, but now we're beginning to perfect them a bit. Um, can I get your top line, a few minutes on COVID and- yeah, No, uh, I, I'd be happy to. I mean, I'm delighted with the uh, vaccine progress. I was on the FDA panel yesterday, mm -hmm. voted for this yep. um, new one. And I think it's uh, great that we have two and we have some that are coming down the pipeline. We hope they work too. They're not based on mRNA technology. If they work as well, the good news is they may be uh, less expensive to manufacture and a lot easier to distribute because they may not require as much of a cold chain. Uh, so the vaccine progress has been great, but there are a couple of uh, things that we have to realize. First of all, it's going to be a while before we get everybody vaccinated. Mm. And secondly, we may never get everybody vaccinated, which means we're going to have people who uh, still get COVID and end up in the hospital and need treatment. And I think where people have uh, gotten lost with COVID therapy is they don't understand the complexity of the disease and the stages of the disease. And they've tried to lump it together as if it's a single thing like coronary artery disease. And by that, I mean uh, coronary artery disease is caused by a um, combination of bad lipids and inflammation uh, resulting in uh, plaques in your coronary arteries and blockages of heart attack. Pretty simple. And if you bring down the lipids or you decrease other things that uh, accelerate the narrowing of the vessels like your blood pressure or 
inflammation. You pretty simple to do large trials of a single intervention and show improvements in how coronary artery disease does. COVID is much more complicated. Uh, in um, early disease, uh, most people do pretty well uh, mm -hmm. if they don't have risk factors. In later disease, um, it's probably less the viral replication, the virus growing that causes people to, to develop pneumonia and die. Uh, it's the inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you start trying to study what uh, drugs to treat COVID with, um, you need to think about which patients with COVID you're treating. If you're treating somebody with late stage disease in the hospital who's already got this inflammatory response, you might want to use steroids or an um, immune modulator. But that same approach given to somebody who is just developing their immune response to COVID to try to contain it would be deleterious. And so some of these large, large trials that had tens of thousands of people in them, and then doctors have just kind of randomly chosen drugs, they've tried to sort out later what didn't, what helped the patient. Uh, a lot of the times the conclusion is nothing seems to work, but it's because they're so large, they're not looking at the right, the, the patients in a segmented way. If you actually looked at the people in the hospital who had uh, inflammation driving pneumonia, those who got steroids probably benefited, but you lose them in the in this soup of all the other people who didn't need the steroids. The same thing's true with remdesivir. Uh, it's a drug that if given to people early in the disease when it's being driven by viral replication, in other words, when the virus is growing and that's what's making uh, the inflammation uh, uh, proceed, remdesivir works. But if you wait until you have a bunch of people in a large trial and most of them are in the hospital on a respirator, it's not surprising that you can't show a mortality benefit with remdesivir. So people get lost, I think, in thinking that this is a simple disease like uh, coronary artery disease. Now, having said that, if you understand uh, the pathogenesis of the disease and understand which patients, which patients are most likely to benefit from a, dip, a given type of intervention, I think we can make dramatic progress uh, with therapeutics in, in COVID. Uh, for example, with remdesivir, the problem with it is that it is only available, it can only be given intravenously. Mm. So we don't give it to outpatients. But if you had an a, a easily, uh, a well-tolerated tablet that you could give to people who were just beginning to get ill and prevent them from going on to be in the hospital, uh, you could have probably dramatic benefit uh, with an antiviral drug. Uh, so uh, that's an area that needs to be pursued. Uh, the, uh, but I think that, um, when people understand that some of the lung pathology isn't just like pneumonia, it's clotting. Uh, mm -hmm. Those patients, when you identify the ones who are having clotting troubles, those are people you want to study anticoagulants in. Yep. But that's very difficult to do when you're trying to study everybody with COVID in the same, uh, in the same study. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's uh, one of the things that's caused this false dichotomy of whether remdesivir works or doesn't, or whether dexamethasone works or doesn't. People mm -hmm. haven't understood the clinical trials. I, I appreciate your insight there. Um, you know, Dr. Scully, it's it's uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, listening to you and and, uh, and and listening to your insight on these matters. Uh, and really, um, as, you know, when I met Stephanie last year, I, I was really excited about it and just hearing uh, about everything moving forward and, and having these successes. It's it's uh, it's it's. Uh, when you look at these numbers in terms of the uh, drug resistant infections, um, you're on the front line of, uh, of unfortunately what's coming. And um, thank you for being, thank you for being there. It's uh, I'm really wishing you, you both the best moving this forward and having all the success uh, with it. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode uh, on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Dr. Robert Schooley. University of California, San Diego Professor of Medicine at the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health and the co-director of their Center for Innovative Fash Applications and Therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Scully, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. And as we say on the show, thank you for creating a better tomorrow for all of us uh, and because this is a, a sizable problem. And, um, and thank you for being on the front line. So, well, really thanks, for having the to, thanks for having the opportunity to talk to you, and uh, thanks for helping us uh, talk to the public about what science can do. I think uh, 
uh, we can make a lot of progress and make the world better. And um, uh, these kinds of opportunities to talk about it, I think, are really helpful. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much.